online. Okay, testing again. All right, is if there's somebody online that could just validate that you can hear our audio, if you could come off mute and say, yes, you can hear us. Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, all right. And Sammy, if you can click on to the slide so my little clicker works, then I think we'll be ready to go. All right, thank you. So we'll call this meeting to order. My name is Budge Courier. I'm with the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. I'm the chair of the 9-1 Advisory Board. We'll do a, a quick roll call. Uh, Chief Ellison. Kurt Wall. I'm here. Oh, Chief, thank you. I got you. All right, and I think I need to verify that you're online and alone where you are or you just have to identify whoever else is in the room with you you could confirm that for me chief ellison i am uh, alone um, in my office and i have some news to report i um i'm still on the board but i was promoted to commissioner on the 12th so just if my name's mentioned as chief ellison it might just people might say oh he's a commissioner now so i got promoted to commissioner uh Commissioner Field, Assistant Commissioner Field for our department, but still in the fight, still on the board. But I just um, my my role has changed slightly. So, all right, Commissioner Allison, thank you for letting us know that, and and congratulations on your promotion. And if it's a typical state promotion, you're going to be required to do more and get paid less. So, welcome aboard. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right, Kurt Wallace. Here. Mark Chase. Present. Chief Ramirez. Here. Jennifer Gonzalez. Chief White. Here. And Demetrius Sidney. Here. All right. Well, we have a quorum. So thank you all for those that uh, are participating in person and, and online. Uh, item number two is approval of the previous me meeting minutes. We met at Sequoia Pacific in Sacramento uh, in May of 2024. Uh, the meeting minutes have sent out to, been sent out to the board members. I'll entertain any motions for updates or uh, corrections to the minutes from the board. All right, seeing, hearing none, do we have a motion to approve? I'll motion to approve. All right, a motion from Kurt to approve, and do we have a second? Second. Second from Mark, appreciate that. And I think make sure their mics are unmuted because, all right. Oh, you got to make sure the mics are close to your, so we can hear you when you speak. That'd be great. All right, so we'll do a quick roll call um, to make sure that we're all in agreement that we're going to approve these uh, meeting minutes. Commissioner Ellison. I approve. All right. Kurt Wallace. I approve. All right. Mark Chase. Approve. Chief Ramirez. Approve. Jennifer Gonzalez. Chief White. Approve. And Demetrius, Sydney. Approve. Thank you. All right. The meeting minutes are approved. Thank you for that. Moving on to agenda item number three. Uh, this is closed session so the way closed session works if um, if any of the board members have anything that they would like to discuss from a security um, or or possible litigation perspective then you would just make a motion and, and we could go into closed session for that no one had communicated to the board that there, there was anything they anticipated in today's meeting but we'll entertain any motions that any of the board members might have for a closed session All right, not seeing or hearing anything. So we will move on to agenda item number four. I believe we have Paul from Cal OES online uh, standing by for our legislative update for agenda item number four. Paul, if you're online, please come off mute and provide your report. Yes, hi, Budge. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, good morning. My name is Paul McInnes, legislative coordinator um, at Cal OES. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to give a brief uh, legislative update this morning. 
Um, I've got a few um, state bills I want to um, uh, brief on today, but just a couple um, legislative calendar um, notes for the for the board and the group here. So the appropriation suspense file hearing was last uh, Thursday, the 15th. Um, we were watching that closely. We saw a fair amount of bills either held in committee or significantly amended. So given that some bills that I briefed out on last uh, meeting uh, will not be included because either they were amended to uh, take certain provisions out that uh, don't apply anymore to the to the board or they were just held altogether. Um, the last day of the legislative session is uh, quickly approaching here. Uh, it's August 31st, so the end of the month. Um, so we are we are pretty busy here in, in legislative affairs, hence the reason I was not able to be in person today. Um, and then the governor has um, to the end of September to sign or veto um, all the bills that are going to be put on his desk. So I've just got a few state bills that I want to um, give some updates on uh, where they're at and just a brief summary of. So I'll start here, um, AB 1863 um, from Assembly Member Ramos. Uh, this bill uh, would revise the existing feather alert statute um, by changing conditions required to request an activation and what is expected of CHP during the request and activation process. Um, this bill um, has passed through and um, is enrolled to the governor's desk as of uh, the 14th of this month. Um, next is AB uh, 2765, Assembly mem Member Pe Pellerin. Uh, the bill would require the CPUC to develop and implement rules to conduct random annual facility checks to verify that providers of telecommunication service are in compliance with their plans submitted to and approved by the Commission regarding backup electricity for telecommunications infrastructure. That bill is currently on third reading um, on the Senate floor. Um, next bill is AB 3090, Assembly Member Mainshine. Um, this one would authorize and encourage a public water system when updating an emergency notification plan uh, to provide water users um, means of, tech, of communications technology, um, including but not limited to text message, email, or social media. That bill was chaptered in back in July, so that is law now. Um, a, uh, next, AB 3179. Uh, and I forgot to mention this. I've made this um, report available available to Samantha to uh, circulate and um, be made available to the board and the group. Um, AB 3179, um, this bill uh, through January 2030 would exempt emergency telecommunications vehicles owns or owned or purchased by um, telecom providers that participate in uh, the federal emergency alert system, provide access to 911 emergency services, or provide wireless connectivity during service outages. Uh, let's see. And then last bill I want to share with the group here is SB 1003 um, by Senator Dodd. The bill would require electrical corporations to take into account both the need to minimize the risk of catastrophic wildfire as soon as possible and the amount of risk addressed for the cost of the proposed mitigation within the utilities uh, wildfire mitigation plan. Uh, let's see, so that's that's all the bills that I wanted to share with the group this morning. Um, if there's any questions you have of any of these bills or anything else, um, I will be standing by. Um, but other than that, that's all I've got this morning. Budge, thank you. All right, Paul, thank you for your report. Any questions from the board members on any of the legislative? All right, any piece of legislation you're tracking that we're not on that list? Okay, you know, I, I, I go ahead, one, Chief. If you could, um, Rebecca Ramirez. Um, there was a bill that was regarding uh, 
fuel mitigation on roadsides not requiring CEQA, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the bill's name or the specificity of it, but I didn't hear that mentioned in here. Has that bumped off? Um, if it was on the last report, then it may have been bumped off, yes. But let me look in and try to find that bill and report back. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Paul, if you... Yeah. Well, if you can include that, uh, do a search and just include that in your summary that you send out uh, okay. what the disposition of it is. That'd be great. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the board or questions? All right. Any comments from the public, either in the room or online for agenda item number four? All right. Seeing, hearing none. Thank you, Paul, for your report. We appreciate it. And we look forward to um, the, the written report being sent out. All right, we're moving on to agenda item number five. This is an update from our 911 emergency communications branch. Mr. Paul Troxel is going to step up and give us a report. Take it away, sir. Hi, good morning, everybody. Paul Troxel, 911 branch manager. Um, I'm here to provide uh, a brief out on all of these topics. Um, we'll start with our 911 outage information. Uh, this is our legacy outage data for the last quarter of uh, April, May, and June. So in legacy 911 network, uh, here are the uh, outage minutes represented. Um, and then we move to uh, CPE at the PSAP. Um, we notice April, um, we did have a high experience of CPE outages. Uh, and then in May and June, it seemed to normalize uh, down to a lower number. Location outages, we're seeing a significant decline in legacy location outage because we've transitioned the majority of location over to our next gen 911 uh, system. And we'll discuss that on the next slide. Um, you'll see here in June, we were down to 296 minutes. Uh, that should represent a number that continues to go down to zero as all of those services are transitioned. And if anyone has questions on these slides on the board, just uh, interrupt him as he's speaking. So that way you get your question answered at that time. Go ahead, sir. Yep. All right, here's our uh, outage report for NextGen 911. In aggregation, uh, in April and May, we saw zero minutes. Uh, in June, we did see a, uh, an outage in aggregation that was one, one carrier um, who could not be aggregated into network. Uh, that vendor uh, did go back, work with the carrier, get that corrected. Uh, we do not see uh, any other issues in this current quarter uh, to this date. Um, the vendor uh, was quick to identify that work with the 911 branch in getting resolution and report back on that outage. And then for NGCS, again, the way we've designed this network is to be uh, redundant and robust. Uh, so for the last quarter, we had zero minutes of service impacting outage. And I think that's the important distinction here is when we report an outage, the way the network is designed is if there's a network failure or a failure of component, there's failover that should occur. Um, so we could have a vendor component fail, but the service rolled over as designed and there was no disruption to the service. The 911 call was delivered to the right PSAP and the person received the assistance immediately without disruption. Our location outages, uh, we do see an increase in location outage in next gen. However, for June, we are reporting zero minutes. And we attribute to this as, as we transition from the legacy location into next gen location, um, there was some um, work that the vendors needed to do to shore up network and delivery and get everything uh, delivered to the PSAP without disruption. And the vendors continue to do a good job of getting that shored up. In network outage, again, the way we have this network designed, we have multiple network paths into each PSAP where services are live. We could have one network fail and the region vendor has redundant network. And if both of those fail, the prime network vendor has redundant network to PSAP. 
So those services automatically fail over and the call gets delivered. Again, no service disrupting outages for the last quarter. And then in, in CPE, we have no reported outages. Uh, we do have two current live deployments of CPE with 40 other, 40 plus other projects approved and in some state of deployment. And then we'll talk about CPE here in a future slide. Uh, so we'll see more deployments and tracking the performance of the cloud CPE uh, as we continue to move through future meetings. Any questions on next gen 911 uh, outages? I just want to highlight something um, for the board to, to just note. If you just look at the location outages that are shown on the screen, I don't know, Paul, do you have an average of what we were seeing in terms of legacy location outages month to month? Uh, no, I don't Is have that average off. 10 or 15,000 minutes a month. So basically, moving from next gen to next gen from legacy, we've gone from a very high, you know, number of location outages to essentially zero. So this is a huge, you know, step forward for us, you know, hats off to the 911 team for doing that. But your PSAP should start to see this difference as well, that uh, location becomes more and more reliable, which is one of the things we had talked about about next gen 911. So um, these stats for me at my level, that's what I'm looking at. Are we actually doing what we promised we would do. So this is exciting. Yeah. All right, and I'm sorry, uh, the last one, text to 911, there were no service disruptions uh, for text to 911 in this last quarter. All right, this next slide represents our call volume for 2023. Uh, we are just past our halfway point for the November meeting. Uh, we'll start to evaluate the 2024 stats take a look at uh, where we are as we go into November, if we are tracking to be consistent with prior year performance. Um, I think it's very important um, to state California remains the front runner across the nation with the uh, 911 call volume, uh, second to Texas, uh, who sits somewhere around 23 million uh, in uh, total 911 call volume. So uh, our network is very large, very complex, built uh, for survivability, uh, but with this workload, we we need uh, that type of robust network to support our citizens. All right, so in the last, well, at least um, six board meetings that I've, I've provided this report out, um, we, the 911 branch team has been working very hard uh, to push for uh, migration, work with all of our vendors, um, from the, the prime network vendor to our region vendors, our current CPE vendors for uh, legacy CPE configuration, make sure all of our racks and equipment is installed and configured and tested, and then tested and tested some more. Um, earlier this year, we uh, signed a contract with Prometheum One, who uses 911 Authority as a subcontractor to support our pre-migration testing and our migration, bringing on uh, new carriers onto the network. Um, they have been doing a wonderful job, um, very meticulous testing. All of our vendors have been supporting all of the testing. Um, our main focus uh, has been in Kern County with um, NGA 911 and uh, Autos is the prime network service provider. They have 11 PSAPs. Since our last meeting, um, we have been able to deploy 10 of those 11 PSAPs with, um, we've got bandwidth in cinch, uh, VoIP carriers deployed at 10 of those PSAPs. Edwards Air Force Base is our uh, one PSAP in Kern County that we have not deployed yet. We continue to work with the team there at Edwards uh, to evaluate um, how how we will support deployment and the status of their CPE and CPE configuration. Um, we are continuing um, to work with NGA on deployment of wireless carriers, um, but we are very excited. Um, as of the 5th of August, that was our last update, we have all Kern County PSAPs with the exception of Edwards live with at least uh, one uh, carrier, Singe and or bandwidth. 
So I'll take a quick pause here for any questions. Yes, sir. Just to clarify at the last meeting, uh, it had mentioned about a cutover occurring, I believe in June was an anticipated cutover. Is kind of getting into details, but did that happen on time? Does this, when you say that it's live with bandwidth and cinch, I'm not clear what that means as far as the, what's so we, actually gone live. We weren't able to make that June date uh, because of testing and configuration that required at the PSAP. So um, our first cut in Kern County uh, was on the 29th of July. We did get uh, Cal State LA live with bandwidth on the 25th of July uh, for LA region. Um, and then the team has also done work in Imperial County as of August 1st deploying. Although Imperial is currently live, we deployed another carrier, which ultimately in the big picture is relieving carriers off of selective router so we can get closer to decommission of the uh, selective router specific to Imperial County. Thank you. So when you say VoIP carriers, is that um, anybody, any VoIP service, or is that just one specific carrier? Uh, so it's the carriers who use cinch and bandwidth to aggravate that, or aggregate that VoIP traffic. So I do, Ryan, do we know what carriers are using those So it, it could be two or it could be 50 VoIP carriers. Uh, we haven't tracked to that uh, detail. But I think to your point, if we look here on our uh, 2023 workload, VoIP traffic represents about 6% of the overall 911 workload. So for Kern County, roughly, 6% of their overall workload has been aggregated onto the next gen 911 network. So is Cinch like the prevailing VoIP standard? Is that what that is or? I think Cinch and bandwidth are, are the primaries. Do we know, is there any other primary aggregator like Cinch and bandwidth, Ryan? Yeah. So are there other VoIP carriers out there that use a different delivery method that would not be included in Cinch and bandwidth? Hi, Mark. Say, say the question one more time. So are there other VoIP carriers? Is this 100% of the VoIP traffic in the county that's being delivered, or is there other like delivery methods? Are other carriers potentially using another method that is not included? That's a good question because I was just looking that up. The remaining carriers that we have at, let's just use Imperial. Uh, Cinch, Utility Telecom, Intrato. Intrato is another one that uh, performs the aggregated service, Verizon Business, and yeah, and, and that's it. Those are, the, those are the remaining carriers. Okay, so like Comcast, right, which is a big weight carrier, they're included within the... No, but there is no presence down in Imperial. So Comcast is like, um, if we took the uh, the, the um, Tuolumne area, Comcast has a presence there, but Comcast does not have a presence down in Imperial. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, any other questions about the uh, updated deployment? Okay, our focus continues in Kern County. Uh, we are continuing to work with the region provider to migrate wireless traffic. Uh, we continue to do some testing and validation there. Uh, we're working in the uh, southern region with Lumen. Orange County is the focus there. Uh, Lumen had some RAC remediation that uh, needed to occur in uh, the majority of PSAPs there. Uh, we do have a meeting uh, scheduled with Lumen leadership um, hopefully by the end of this week to get a status of that rack remediation and when they can start the um, actual migration work. They have been conducting the pre-migration testing in the background when they can, uh, but ultimately we need all of the PSAP remediation work done before we can go and deploy a carrier. And then uh, in the Northern region, our focus continues to uh, continue uh, full deployment in El Dorado County and Placerville PD and uh, El Dorado County Sheriff. 
um, and then working into Placer County. Uh, so that work uh, continues in the background with our uh, technical team with OES and the Prometheum 1911 Authority team. Quick pause for any questions here. All right. So something that has been a looming conversation with us for since 2020. Uh, the cloud CPE contract was signed in June of 2020 as a requirement all of the CPE providers and resellers had to validate in the lab. Since our last meeting, every CPE provider has been validated and every reseller of that CPE solution has been validated and approved in the OES lab. So we are no longer in testing phase as a part of getting out there to sell. Any lab work now will be based on software updates that the CPE provider uh, provides that solution and a normal course of business. The engineering team, the OES engineering team will be monitoring that, working with those CPE providers to uh, monitor any update, test any updates that are required in the lab, and they can push that out to the live environment. With that said, all cloud CPE provider, uh, providers have been cleared to sell and install and go live. Everyone can go live in the state of California. Installs are expected within 90 days of the approved TDE-288 and signed statement of work. And any questions regarding your cloud CPE, no matter where you are in the process, contact your PSAP advisor. And we'll talk about the advisor team here in just a moment. Uh, and I think it's important to mention all stop clocks for all CPE vendors have been released by Cal OES. Everybody has a green light to sell, install, and go live in California. I'll take a quick pause for any questions. So does that mean the last meeting, I think we talked about the 22nd of May, right? Um, all of the cross connects was the deadline. So all of the cross connects are in all of the data centers. So what I will say, Mark, is we have at least a connection with prime network service provider and a regional network service provider to validate uh, capability in the lab. We have released all stop clocks and we've told any NGCS provider that has any outstanding connection or validation configuration work that needs to be done from the signed TDE 288, you have 90 days to fix that. When we go to go live, if the region or whatever vendor is not capable of delivering a call, then that's an NGCS failure. We we are going to get called. We are going to get our CPE deployed and finish these network connections. Okay, so the cross connects, as far as you know, are not 100% complete yet. That's correct. But they, I I will say we had a status update uh, Tuesday. Um, they are very close to being finished. It, we're like weeks of getting the cross connect and final configuration done. This is, we're not long lead times. And then you talked about financial penalties being assessed at the last meeting, is that happening? Uh, that'll happen if there's uh, an in inability to deliver a call on the next gen core service network. Okay, so anyone who's signed a contract with any of the next gen providers um, to implement cloud CPE, they should be moving forward at this point. Yes. And what was the effective date on that? Uh, let's see. CPE was mid-July. Was about about mid-July is when all CPE was cleared. Uh, Janae and her team have the specific dates of all the approved 288s and statements of work. So if you have a specific question about your PSAP, they'll, they'll be able to memorialize that date when you've got a green light for install and go live. June 26th. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Do we know how many cloud CPEs are deployed currently approximately? So we have two live, Wasco and Desert Hot Springs. Um, and then we have 40-ish in some state of deployment. And I believe the first one coming up to their 90 day is uh, the second week of September. Um, so the, the next, the third deployment should go live about the second week of September. Um, and then pretty much 
every week or every other week um, for that solution to go live until their their stack of projects have um, been completed. We've got um, one other, has uh, the Viper project been approved yet? Okay, so we, we have a uh, Entrado Viper solution that's in the final stages of approval. Um, so when that's finally approved, they'll have 90 days to get that installed and go live. Do we know if the, uh, for example, like Desert Hot Springs, is it working as promised, the CPE equipment? Both Desert Hot Springs and Wasco are working. And anybody who has uh, questions about the specific performance, we would encourage them to reach out to those PSAPs. Both have been very helpful and resourceful answering questions. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, so um, this next couple of slides was a, a request. We we seem to still have some confusion about what is 911, legacy 911, and legacy CPE, what is next gen 911, and cloud CPE. So these next couple of graphics represent the call flow in legacy 911. So from the caller, the call will go through selective router and get routed to the PSAP. And then the PSAP has a network connectivity uh, down for location and location is delivered back to the PSAP. So no change in call flow. In this is considering no next gen 911 calls being delivered and you're still on your legacy CPE. This is next gen 911 with legacy CPE. So I think the majority of folks in this room, the caller calls 911, the call is routed into next gen core service. It's processed and routed across the uh, next gen 911 trunk into PSAP. And the PSAP does a location dip from PSAP into the cloud location service and then pulls that back down into PSAP. Any questions on these last two slides? Any clarification? This next one is legacy 911 connecting into cloud CPE. So your caller is still routing through a selective router. That call is going into the PSAP back room on a camera trunk. When it hits the back room, it's leaving your PSAP to go to the cloud where your CPE solution resides. It's processed in the cloud and delivered back down to the PSAP for your dispatchers to answer. And then location is still dipping across that uh, network connectivity to deliver uh, location. And then this one is when we're fully deployed, full next gen 911 with full cloud connectivity. Your caller calls 911, that call goes into the cloud, gets delivered to across ESI net to the um, CPE provider. CPE provider delivers it to the PSAP across the NG911 trunk. And again, this is at full deployment state when all selective routers have been decommissioned in the state. So I'll take a quick pause for any questions or clarification there. So I have a question because I want to make sure everybody's tracking. Keep in mind that all four scenarios, well, three of the four scenarios could exist at your PSAP at any one time. In other words, you could be <clears throat> legacy CPE, next gen and legacy 911 all at the same time, or you can be cloud CPE, legacy C 911, next gen 911 at the same time. And this goes to your question mark about the carriers. So during the transition until all carriers are delivered at your PSAP across legacy, you'll be getting calls legacy and next gen simultaneously into whatever <coughs> CPE you have, which is we understand is going to be very confusing for you as a PSAP, but that's how the system's designed. If we did it any other way, We'd have to wait till we're fully deployed before we did anything. And, and we knew that wasn't an option. So 
um, you know, it's it's complex, but all of this is working and has been validated in every scenario up there uh, works. Sorry, go ahead, Chief, you had a question. No, I just had a question about it. So we have, we've seen that the reliability is way better. Is there a processing time or a, a reduction in how long it takes for all of that to take place going from one to the other? So in general, um, in your legacy world, it takes roughly five to seven seconds for the call to arrive at your PSAP, depending on a number of factors. If you have an ACD, it could be further delayed depending on how you're processing that. ACD is an automatic call distribution. In next gen, it's roughly two seconds or less. So there is a, it is faster, but we're also seeing that, you know, if the cloud, if the CPE could actually read the location in the header, you would even see some more improvements. And um, I was down at Riverside County Sheriff uh, last week some of your PSAPs are probably seeing this where the location being provided by the carriers is just simply appears to be getting better anecdotally. I haven't run the stats on it. I don't know, you all run PSAPs. You're, you're probably seeing that, right? Which is good news because then the better that location gets at the time of call setup, the more accurately we can route the call when we first get the call, which is huge because that cuts down on transfers and everything else. So. The short answer is yes, it is faster um, with some caveats because we can get even better and more accurate if the carriers give us the right location at call setup from the beginning. So here's some statistics that our uh, PSAP advisor unit uh, it continues to track. Um, for CPE installation, this is an important graphic here. We can install CPE and have it go live, but it won't be represented on this graphic until the PSAP goes through their system acceptance checklist and accepts the CPE. And it's very important um, to note, especially for the, the memberships that you represent, when a, PC, uh, a PSAP has new CPE installed, to work with the vendor as soon as they go live to work through that um, system acceptance checklist. Now we know there's some fine tuning and configuration, and it, especially in the first couple of CPE deployments, we know that's gonna happen. The challenge is the um, funding allotment doesn't start until system acceptance. So if we have a PSAP that sits for a year 18 months on system acceptance, that means that their system is 12 to 18 months older at the time they get a, a allotted a refresh. And in legacy CPE, there were some PSAPs that this this was an issue and we had to work with the PSAP and the vendors to make sure any, any questions and concerns were cleaned up. In cloud CPE, we really wanna track this. Um, we've got a, a lot of support from the vendors to get that deployment right and get configuration. And if there is something that that's little or administrative that the PSAP has a concern about, when you sign system acceptance, it moves that system from the deployment or installation team into the day two support team with the vendor. So it gives different resources that could be available to help resolve that. And I would always say if a PSAP has questions, work with your PSAP advisor and the OES team, we can continue to walk through, work with the PSAP and the vendors to make sure everybody's getting all of that detail. So we, we have Desert Hot Springs and Wasco. Wasco has not done a complete system acceptance yet. They haven't been live on their system that long. We are working with them to do that. So their system is not yet signified on this graphic, but we expect this by November to reflect at least a couple new uh, CPE installs. And then as we go into 2025, this number should be climbing. And here's a, our legacy CPE. <clears throat> this is, is reflecting 240 PSAPs that have aging equipment. And this is a, a conversation I think I have with my team about 25 times a day. Um, we 
are now having that discussion. Um, our, our PSAP advisory team is fully um, staffed and their training is almost complete. Um, so they are out hitting the streets now doing fiscal and operational reviews. Um, so they, if, if your PSAP is represented in that total number of 240, expect a visit from the state. Um, we want to talk through what's happening at your PSAP, where you are, and make sure you have all the information to make the appropriate decisions to upgrade your CPE. And as I said, our advisory team is fully staffed. We are super proud of the work that Janae has done. Um, Andrew has been supporting Janae and that team uh, in training and getting them prepped and ready. Um, so far, they have completed five fiscal and operational reviews. Um, Janae has gone out with the entire team. Um, they've been meeting with PSAPs, training that team up, and they're getting ready to cut those individuals loose to go uh, start meeting with their individual PSAPs on their own. Um, so if you haven't had a, a four done, um, be anticipating somebody from our team reaching out and, and starting to schedule some of those uh, operational reviews. Our goal is to get those done about every five years. We've got a lot of PSAPs. We now have a fifth person added to the team, so it should be easier for us to achieve that goal. Um, and really, the conversation is about uh, funding, CPE replacement, the training allotment, operational and technical standards, and answer any questions that the PSAPs have. And we'll go into a little bit more uh, detail on the, the fours here in a moment. <clears throat> So as, as we've done um, some outreach to some of the PSAPs, um, because during COVID, we, we suspended the fours. We tried to do them virtually, but it just, it, it didn't work as well. Um, and then because of staffing, we haven't been able to really get in and really kick the fours off like we've wanted to. There's been a lot of change in PSAP leadership. Um, so when Janae's team started to do outreach and say, hey, I want to come visit you. Hi, I'm from Cal OES and I'm here to help. Uh, some of those PSAP managers kind of panicked. Um, so the message that we wanted to convey today is we are not there for an audit. Uh, we are there uh, to help bridge the communication gap between the PSAP and the state of California, specifically what OES and the 911 branch can do. We want to build collaboration and build that rapport. We want to make sure that the PSAP management and the PSAP leadership understand that they have subject matter experts within the 911 branch that they can rely on. We do need to do an accounting of the network and the, the call handling equipment that's at the PSAP. Make sure that um, the amount of positions that we show the PSAP bought, they didn't go and sell them on eBay to bridge a budget gap or whatever. Um, if they've added equipment, we want to make sure we understand what that equipment is. Um, and if they've, if they have future needs, we want to make sure that the team is there uh, to address their future needs and how the 911 branch could support them. Um, we are also um, telling people refer over to our operations manual, uh, chapter six. Uh, for more information um, about what the four is there for. Um, but ultimately, we, we are not there um, to do a high pressure audit and make anybody feel bad. We wanna go in, we wanna be collaborative, we wanna have a conversation, we wanna be supportive. And if there's questions that the PSAP has, our advisors are the first point of contact if they don't have the answers, they know how to reach back into the team to get the subject matter experts engaged in that conversation to get the support back to the PSAP. So I'll pause for quick any quick questions or comments about the fours. All right. So uh, this is the updated list of all of our uh, PSAP advisors and their contact information. And then ultimately, Janae's information's there at the bottom. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to those advisors. Um, and I'm extremely proud of the team that we've hired. 
Um, they're all motivated. Um, they all work very well together. Um, and they're very excited to get out and support the Peace apps. All right, here's our current uh, setting up fund condition statement. Uh, this uh, was pulled off of um, um, the online, um, uh, the uh, budget uh, last week. Um, so this reflects our current 24-25 uh, budget. It is that time of year where we are going through our uh, setting a rate uh, calculation for calendar year 25. Um, we have um, the 988 fee and the 911 fee that will be going through that exercise this month. Um, we have almost, all, almost everything drafted and ready to review um, either tomorrow or Friday to submit our draft report up to executive review and approval and then submit uh, over to CDTFA by the end of September. So in the last uh, three years, we've been able to maintain the fee at 30 cents. So this time of year, um, we do uh, the review. We have to collect all of the access line data. All of that is due uh, to Cal OES by the end of July. All of our carriers have reported to us um, Samantha and Dylan from our team have compiled all of that draft data. They pushed it to uh, Jessica and I to start our analysis. Uh, we will complete all of that by the end of the month, have our letters drafted, and submit to executive for review. And I'll take a quick pause for any questions about uh, the set and the rate. Yes, sir. I noticed it looks like they did a correction for that excess money. Is that a pretty big one yes i think it was 179 million yeah we don't have any details on that but if you go back a couple of fund conditions there was a plus up yeah. of a couple hundred million and we had the same question and you scraped it back yeah apparently it's uh, yeah we were tracking so uh i don't we don't we don't have any more details other than just to know that what's in the fund and has been dedicated to 911 has remained dedicated to 911 so um you know, don't read that as a, oh, wait, somebody grabbed something. They didn't. Uh, everything that came in that was collected for 911 fees has been used to support the bottom portion of this fund condition, which is how we allocate it to the various state agencies. Um, and probably the one you, you, this group is most interested in is that local assistance number, right? That's the one that we use to directly support the Peace House. What is the increase in the uh, the line right above local assistance in the next year? It almost uh, doubles the OES state operations. Is that for additional staff or? No. So there was a BCP that we submitted um, through the budget process that was included in this year's budget. So that includes an allocation to support uh, building out the California Radio Interoperable System or CRIS to support state and local agencies from a radio perspective. That's a short time authorization for the next four years to build that system out. And that's primarily where that, that extra funding is in. Thank you. Okay, right. any other questions from the board on agenda item number five? Okay, any questions from the public on agenda item number five, either in the room or online? <coughs> All right, just giving a long pause to make sure there's not. All right, we'll move on to agenda item number six. Thank you, Mr. Troxell. So for agenda item number six, I'm gonna invite Dr. Jessica Sodi to come up. Um, she's gonna give a, an update on our 988 system and so if you've been tracking this uh, 988 process, we were required to select a uh, 988 system director, and we have. And so I want to introduce to you Dr. Jessica Sodi. She's our new 988 system director. She joined us, what, three weeks ago, a month ago? Uh, one month ago. So she's a month in, and uh, she's going to give an update for us on 98. If you want more information on this particular agenda item, the Technical Advisory Board meets tomorrow. And so 
what you're going to see here in the next five minutes, we will cover in two hours tomorrow. So a lot more information, obviously, tomorrow. Uh, but we know the interaction between these two systems is important. So with that, take it away. You stole my thunder, President McBetta, the pitch for tomorrow's meeting. Um, so, and that's, uh, we encourage the public to attend um, tomorrow's technical advisory board. Um, don't have any significant updates to report um, here. Um, so continue to work uh, to on the 901 and 988 uh, interface um, that was certified as being, you know, uh, the interoperability is so April 30th, 2024. Uh, and we intend to deploy this capability to all 12 988 centers once we receive the go ahead from SAMHSA to deploy the technology. But we're still in a holding pattern there. The testing is completed um, May 2nd of this year, where we validated calls, texts, and chat workflows. Um, we're compliant with the requirements identified both by SAMHSA and Vibrant, uh, and we continue to be compliant with the reporting requirements. Uh, SAMHSA has changed a few of them, but uh, we still continue to meet uh, any reporting requirements uh, by the centers and on our end. Uh, again, still waiting. Uh, for the go-ahead from SAMHSA to begin the phase deployment. Um, once we get that go-ahead, uh, we're looking at about six months um, after approval to implement uh, call workflow and about text and chat. So I think we're looking at budget another nine months um, after that approval. Um, uh, and the only change here uh, is that the 988 mobile uh, dispatch RFP has now entered the negotiation phase. Um, the RFP itself is published on the eProcure website, so if you want to take a look and read through that, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, and we anticipate that the contract will be awarded in September. Uh, a few uh, kind of updates on the FCC and Vibrant side. Um, so the uh, FCC uh, we're particularly focused on docket number 18-336. Uh, they received uh, over 3,000 comments. So as you can imagine, it's going to take the FCC quite a while to go through all of those comments. Uh, in the rulemaking process, their end can take anywhere from six to 18 months to complete. Uh, we would anticipate that based on the number of comments, we're going to be on the uh, longer end of that time frame. Uh, and the uh, centers continue to have discussions uh, regarding uh, the vibrant network agreement. Um, I, I visited uh, seven out of the 12 centers so far, uh, and based on those discussions, uh, no center in California, no 988 center in California has signed uh, or intends to sign uh, the network agreement in its current state. Um, I would defer to, uh, to legal on the MOU um, status as well. Uh, but with, are there any questions? All right, any questions on the 988 update from the board? Okay, any questions from the public or online on agenda item number six? All right, and so if you're wondering, yes, 30 days in, we asked her to present, so that, that happened. <laughs> and you did a far fantastic job, so thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right, moving on to agenda item number seven. Uh, this is an update from our long range planning committee. Uh, I believe they met yesterday. I'm not allowed to attend those meetings unless I'm a member of the public. So uh, uh, not sure what happened, but we're gonna get a fantastic update from Jeff. So take it away, sir. I don't know about a fantastic update, but we will give an update. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those I haven't had a pleasure to meet before, my name is uh, Jeff Logan. Uh, I'm the executive director of Heartland Communications down in San Diego County. And on the LRPC, I represent the California Fire Chiefs Association. So uh, since the last 911 advisory board meeting, the LRPC actually has had uh, two meetings. We had a meeting in July, um, I wouldn't say an emergency meeting, but an out of calendar meeting, uh, regularly scheduled meeting on July 24th. And then we met again yesterday. The meeting on July 24th was I ideally uh, our first uh, group meeting to discuss the uh, staffing and retention study. And we took uh, some actions uh, with our group to meet a little bit more and provide some feedback uh, to the 911 authority following that meeting. Um, and then uh, uh, that was the, the, 
biggest part of that meeting then yesterday's meeting we talked about um, a couple of different projects that we're working on and kind of set the groundwork going forward so one of the uh, items we're working on right now is uh, preparing a document uh, that ideally would go into the hands of uh, PSAP uh, directors, PSAP managers, um, that's helpful for uh, things they should know for policy-based routing and things that they sh should consider. Try and take some of the mystery out of it, um, give them uh, something tangible when they come to those decision points on there. Um, so they want we want to help them uh, understand options uh, when determining how policy-based routing can be set up. Um, it's also uh, intended to provide some clarity on communications that should be had uh, with possible partners, uh, partner PSAPs before the transition, as there will be more options available to each PSAP um, compared to what they see today. That document that we're working on is currently in uh, revision with our team with the intention of before uh, next quarter's meeting, having already sent that document to the California 911 office for review and technical uh, overview before we present to uh, here at the 911 advisory board uh, to move forward with that document. Um, the next topic that we uh, covered was the staffing and retention study. Um, I, I do see that uh, that's like one of the next agenda items here for your discussion. So I won't go into too much detail here. I'd be happy to answer questions or talk about it as it goes forward. But essentially, uh, we met with the 911 authority on August 13th and provided uh, feedback with them on the document of, uh, you know, whether takeaways that we had from it, suggestions, recommendations uh, of how to better uh, shape that document and make it a little more usable for the end users. And uh, th their next steps, they advised us, was to meet with their team internally, and then they would be reaching back out to the uh, state 911 office. The next item that we have uh, that we've been working through was a request uh, from the 911 advisory board for uh, take a look at and make recommendations for regional consolidation um, of, of PSAPs and options throughout the state. And one of the things that we came back to uh, with our group was for me to inquire with the 911 advisory board here is maybe a little bit more direction or leaders intent on that request. Um, I think we have a lot of good ideas. We have uh, some staff members who are interested in uh being a part of that process and having discussions we just want to make sure that we have uh, good direction from from this group here of what the final goal is and then the last thing we had for an update is our regional technology task force there was no meetings uh, in the last quarter as there's currently an effort going on to prioritize uh the the goals of these group and the charter for these groups going forward now that a lot of the next gen 911 uh, project is is underway and um, that train is moving forward focus for those technology or uh, i should say regional task force and that's the end of the report and i'm happy to answer any questions all right, so the one request I heard was for clarification on the work that you want the LRPC to do relative to the regional consolidation effort that you're having them look into. So if there's any board members that want to have, a, you know, add any additional clarity to that based on our last meeting. I'm sorry, I'm going to come in uh, having not recalled or not been part of that discussion too much, but um, from a consolidation or um, effort to kind of, yeah, basically consolidate um, different PSAPs. I think some of the things that come to mind that I'm sure were discussed is the, the economy of scales that can happen with that, that end up allowing the PSAP to, to focus and refocus some of that financial wherewithal to better dispatchers. It seems to be also from a staffing perspective, some of the smaller uh, PSAPs really seem to struggle because some of the larger PSAPs can, you know, thieve away some of the, the, the talent because they have the ability to offer better uh, compensation packages, better working conditions, more stability, uh, less uh, mandatory callback, things like that, that when you get those all together, it kind of brings the roof down on that and, and eliminates some of those stressors that we're probably going to be talking about in this next uh, staffing study. So I think that's probably just scratching the surface of why some of this 
is important. Also, from an operational perspective, I think there's just a lot of operational efficiencies that we see. We see it with fire departments all the time. I don't know if law enforcement does that quite quite the same way, but we see it with fire departments that when they consolidate, generally the costs go down and the service gets better. And so, if there is opportunity for that. Um, I don't know what the cross boundaries are regionally and how communications would work that way and if it, there's some prohibitive pieces there network wise and um, technology wise but I think from an overhead perspective that's the way I kind of see it I don't know if I'd ask my fellow board members to, to chime in on any of that I, I agree with Chief uh, Ramirez uh, from a PSAP perspective uh, it's difficult to think of consolidation and regionalization through a law enforcement side uh, because of the direct control over your jurisdiction. We don't read. Everybody's struggling with the staffing as we see from that study that we And you do get economy of scale, you do get uh, staffing problems, and that, um, that could benefit a region. Uh, or some smaller staff going with that could get all the time to the fire side, not as fire, but I think that would be the direction to go, especially moving for people to hire uh, and train. Any other comments? I would just say that um, from a slightly different angle, uh, that consolidation, you know, there's physical consolidation, but I think there's other consolidation methods, particularly with the new technology. Um, I know on the law enforcement side, you know, one of the challenges for places that haven't already sort of been baked into a consolidated scenario is you have dispatchers who are working front counter and so forth. So when I talk to other police chiefs and they look at these scenarios, um, you know, they go, well, hey, if I lose that, then what about covering the front counter, that sort of thing? Um, I think too is sometimes the issue isn't coverage all the time. So there's other scenarios where, say, a neighboring jurisdiction, you know, might be able to help cover the night for their neighbor, but during the daytime, you know, they can have their own. And I think now with the technology has gotten so much better um, that those types of scenarios are actually very viable. Um, so I think it's got to look at the whole array so that place doesn't go, well, I can't do full consolidation. So it's all, you know, the discussion's over with, I think, to look at what options exist. Um, and I know it's not directly related, but with the LRPC, like the idea of teleworking for dispatch, I know other states are very actively looking at that right now. And when you look at the staffing and study survey um, and, you know, just job issues and so forth, like people trying to take care of families and things we could open up to a greater pool if, for example, you know, somebody has the ability to work from home and, and take care of it. And I know in the past that was never an option for us because of the equipment, but now you can get a laptop with a card on it and you know, do stuff with it. So obviously a lot of considerations within it, but I think it should be looked at because other places are doing it and you could conceivably have somebody, you know, maybe even working for another state answering their calls um, instead of their home state um, if we don't stay with the technology and the demand. All right, any other comments? Go ahead, Mark. I would just offer up that I think do a disservice to dispatchers and small centers, very small centers who may work, you know, five, 10 years and not have a bank robbery or not have a very, like a um, low frequency, high risk incident. And so I think what you've seen in other states like Indiana, uh, Kansas comes to mind, but there's other states that have mandated consolidation because of that, because they have a lot of small rural, rural communities. And what you find with consolidation um, in a regional level is typically the training standards go up, the uh, benefits to the employee go up as well as benefits to the community. So I, I think it is something to look at um, just if you want to take a notation Palo Alto, Los Altos and Mel Mountain View where I work we've been virtually consolidated for the better part of a decade so we'd be happy to provide some feedback for you but we all still maintain separate piece apps but we all share a CAD system, a phone system, um, a radio system so I'm happy to provide some information there but I, I do think about this often because I work at six different piece apps and you do think about you know some of these small centers where you know you may be there the better part of a night and take four or five calls and if it's a pd center only you're transferring to medicals so you're really not getting that much call volume and i think it puts those dispatchers at a, a disadvantage when they do have to handle 
a shooting or you know a swatting incident or something like that and they're all alone and um, having to deal with that and if i could piggyback a little bit on what you said too from a training perspective um, it, it just allow, opens a, just a huge door to advanced training opportunities. Um, and it, it sounds like there's a lot of great ideas up, up here, and not all of us are dispatch uh, professionals here. But um, there's not probably just a one-size-fits-all uh, solution here that different dispatches might be able to explore contracts for service or virtual consolidations or there's probably a lot of um, expertise in that 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 could be brought in um, and it was just kind of delving into some of that maybe able to raise the level of service and and lower the cost and provide more support to our dispatchers I think it, I know we have an upcoming item for like future things but directly related to this it'd be great to hear a presentation like how you guys do that because you're right, not all of us are actively dispatching and those sorts of things, but you know we're involved with advising on these systems to understand like how does that work. Um, that would be very interesting to, to see. And maybe ways in which, from our level here, we might be able to better support places to do those things if that works or full consolidation, whatever that may be. Sounds like you just got added to a future agenda, Mark. November's coming. Can I get my own slide? No, um, you'll get a series of slides. You can get like 10. Yeah, we'll give you 10. 10 uh, slides. It's just one more thing for Jeff. Uh, we had brought it up, and I, I didn't, uh, because I arrived late with the meeting yesterday, and wasn't sure if it was brought up, but we had talked about also, if you could specifically look at, uh, the LRPC could look at uh, the work from home and uh, basically best practices or what it's going to take for centers to implement uh, some type of work from home option. I know in we hear from IAED that in Austria, uh, they have uh, emergency medical uh, call takers at home, and their criteria is that if they fall below a certain standard, if they don't maintain excellence or above, or you know whatever the higher standards are, that they they then have to come back and work in the piece happen until they uh, reestablish their QA score. So, it is happening in other places. Um, I know in Virginia, it happened during the pandemic. They put some call takers at home, but if if you all could just sort of look at that and see who's doing it, uh, what are some best practices, and how it might, what, what, what it would look like in the state of California. Thank you for all your work. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you for that uh, information. A lot of great uh, topics came up out of that, and a lot of the things that uh, deal with consolidation uh, are, are items that we have discussed at the LRPC level. We have a uh, uh, a strong team that's very interested in this topic, and some of them, uh, some of our members are uh, going through this in their own uh, communities. Um, and so, what we were mostly looking forward is just what that direction would look like here. And I think what I what I'm hearing is it would be nice for us from the LRPC to bring forward when we look at regional uh, or consolidation, look at options, utilizing technology, best practices, recommendations, and benefits to agencies that are considering that. So if I'm good with, if I'm on target with that, I'll be happy to bring that back to our group and start uh, rolling our sleeves up and working on that. Just one, one suggestion, Jeff. Um, you know, I'm with San Mateo County, so we dispatch all three disciplines, but we also contract with two other cities to dispatch their services. And there's a lot of um, smaller municipalities that they have dispatchers from three to seven dispatchers where they are struggling with training. Like what everyone said, there is a cost issue as well. Um, my suggestion is that we look at the agencies that might have 10 or less dispatchers because those are the ones that are really struggling that might need the contract, you know, either with a county um, agency or might want to consider the, con the consolidation piece. I wasn't aware that uh, Mark's agency actually has uh, backup for all three that's about at that point. Uh, but for us, we just dispatch for all within that county. So I will look at the agencies for 10 or less dispatchers to see because it, there would definitely be a cost saving for each agency. When you look at benefits, you look at training, you add all that in there. Um, and then I think about the agencies who are who can only open for 12 hours. I think some of them actually close at 9 o'clock at night and transfer their calls over. So they're also not getting the full benefit of the CPE um, costs at that point. So there's a lot of savings. But I would focus on the ones with 7 to 10 dispatchers possibly. Absolutely. I, I appreciate that feedback, and it's good information for us. I think one of the things that we've learned with our team and the little bit of work we've done on this is that the conversation is a little bit nuanced because some of those smaller PSAPs that we interact with um, 
uh, are not open to those discussions right away. It's more of a negative connotation. Consolidation, we don't want to get. All right, sounds like we might be back. So we had a brief intermission there just to double check that our electronic equipment was functioning. So can you hear me online? If somebody online can let me know, come off mute and let me know you can hear us again. Loud and clear. All right, wonderful, thank you. Okay, so during that pause, nothing in the room happened just for the record. Uh, so, Jeff, you were um, finishing up, I think, your comments on agenda item number seven. And I think that was the last of the board comments on item number seven. And just for the record, I'll give a summary for those taking minutes. This is what I heard, that if the Long Range Planning Committee could focus with respect to regional consolidation on considering essentially what are the overall goals we're trying to achieve and specifically look at economies of scale. Uh, how they can better serve the community does it help with staffing and we're going to get to more on that in agenda item number seven operational efficiencies some potential law enforcement barriers were discussed or were discussed 
um, other consolidation methods beyond physical, like virtual consolidation. And on that point, we got an agenda item teed up for the next board meeting for Mark Chase to give an update on virtual consolidation with respect to what you're doing in your PSAPs. Um, some of the uh, part-time coverage, maybe uh, what could be done if you can't support 24 seven, teleworking and how that relates to dispatching and 911 call taking. Is it, should we look at maybe mandating consolidation? Some of the training impacts of that focusing on the advantages for PSAPs that have 10 or less dispatchers. And then I would add one more that we didn't really talk about, but from all of that, how can the state help? Like what should we consider? So this is an advisory board, so we'll take those recommendations back. There's a series of actions that we have to go through in order to take any action, but um, that's something certainly that we'd be willing to look at. Like how can we help in this journey? And then I'll remind you that about six years ago, we did a consolidation study, which has all the factual data. And, and that is 100% accurate still today. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. These specific topics were not addressed in the context of what should we do about it, right? They were talked about sort of at a high level of what consolidation means relative to these. So the work you're doing is de definitely needed and is new from what exists right now. So does that help? Very helpful, thank you. Okay, all right, so that's agenda item number seven, the Long Range Planning Committee report. Do we have any uh, comments from the public, either in the room or online, related to agenda item number seven? All right, seeing, hearing none. Thank you, sir, we appreciate that. All right, agenda number eight, we've been, agenda item number eight is our statewide staffing study. We've been working on this for quite some time and uh, we're excited about the progress that we've made. You heard a little bit of discussion of this in the agenda item number seven, but we wanna give you a deeper dive. So Mr. Paul Troxell is gonna talk us through that. Go ahead, sir. If you can click on the slides so the clicker works, please, over there. Just. All right, um, so just to, to kind of go back on the history of the staffing study, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, during a long-range planning committee, um, one of the committee members had made a comment about the struggles of hiring and retaining staff, um, and that led uh, to further discussion amongst the committee members of their challenges, either in their PSAP or with their regional partners, um, hiring, retaining, training staff members uh, in the PSAP. Um, that led to a discussion from the 911 branch of what is it that we could do? Um, and at the time, we decided probably the best way for us from the 911 branch to help is to get a study out there. Let's start to um, survey PSAPs, find out what's happening. Um, so we, we developed a contract. That contract was issued uh, about a year ago, June. Um, 911 Authority was the vendor selected. They did uh, two surveys. One survey was targeted towards line level dispatchers. The other survey was targeted towards uh, management, PSAP management and supervisors. Um, the data has been collected. The drafted study was delivered uh, to the 911 branch and ultimately to the long range planning committee members to receive their feedback. Uh, and, I, and I really wanna do a huge shout out to the LRPC members here they took this study and really read the study. I mean, really got into the meat and potatoes of this study. Um, they gave a lot of really good feedback. Um, the first wave of feedback went back to the 911 Authority team in early July. They delivered an updated draft and the LRPC members did another deep dive in, in a way to take some of the data points collected and move them higher up into the survey. The real key data that as a PSAP manager, you need to identify. Um, and then some of the um, other data, put that further down. There, there's tons of data points that were collected, but the important parts, the LRPC members uh, gave some feedback to kind of restructure the way the survey responses is drafted. 
so that feedback uh, went back to 911 authority, I believe it was about a week ago. Uh, that team is working on those updates. We were prepared to deliver the draft study and discuss in today's advisory board meeting. With those edits, um, we're going to have the 911 authority team complete those edits, re-deliver this back to the LRPC for one final review. If they agree with that, then we'll present this at the November meeting uh, for the advisory board members um, to provide any feedback. And as soon as we get that updated study, then we'll get that out to the advisory board members so we, we can make sure you have ample time uh, to review and get any um, questions answered. Uh, but ultimately, uh, a long explanation to say more to come in November uh, for the next advisory board meeting. Um, from our perspective, this was a very valuable study. Um, what we did discuss in yesterday's LRPC meeting is having this as a continued agenda topic. As we know, a lot of studies get conducted, they put, get put in a binder, they go up on a shelf, and they become a bookend. Um, we really want this to be kind of a living study. Um, we know of some studies that have occurred nationwide. Uh, we'd like to take a look at those to see is there any correlating data points. And then we'd also like to revisit maybe in two or three years can we do an updated survey to see did anybody take recommendations from this study employ them in their PSAP and see any initial um, changes um, you know one of the uh, items identified was wellness program so if a PSAP does not have a current wellness program you implement a wellness program and all of a sudden uh, your your hiring and retention of dispatchers is improving well that's a key data point that we'd like to um, receive and then maybe in five or seven years do another version of this study to continue to refine this and take a look at how our workforce is evolving um, we talked about telework you know what other programs can a PSAP offer that may be a best practice for PSAP management to take back so I'll take a quick pause for any questions sort of a related question um, Budgetary wise, like uh, I know right now the allocation of CPE positions is based upon call volume and everything else. Just conceivably, like does a board have the authority to recommend, say come down the road, we say that's a really important piece for wellness retention, et cetera. Would the board be able to tell the 911 office, hey, we think that there should be some allocation beyond those positions, say to get like a laptop for an agency or something that can do support remote work or something, or are we constrained by the law or the some other thing. So some good news is when the 2020 contract for CPE was signed, that funding model was completely disassembled and reassembled. So we don't do position per position. We do uh, based on call volume and your allocation is based on that. So if you have extra money or want to purchase like a laptop position, you can do that. And Janae's team um, has all of that data um, so if you wanted to walk through what, it, what does that mean for your PSAP, we're prepared to have those conversations today. But I think what, what I heard you say is an important part of what we can incorporate in the study is how can we from the 911 branch support potential growth in your, in your PSAP if that's a recommendation of the study? Yeah, I think yeah. I'm asking more globally from here as a, as a whole board. Um, for example, in the budget request, there's a significant increase for the radio interoperability piece. And so by that same token, could this board say, hey, we want, I'm just making up a number, we want an extra 10 million to buy devices to help PSAP support additional remote workers. Like what is the process for this board to get information to you to make a budget request for a subsequent year? Yeah, so yes, the board can absolutely make that recommendation. And I would also say that probably in conjunction with the study, we need to look at our operations manual and what we do fund and see if there's anything that we're doing in there that's counterproductive to what the study is saying. So that Thank would you. be the first step. So you, you, you could certainly, as a board member, read through that, come to us with a recommendation and say, hey, the study is saying this, your policy says this, they don't seem to align. Can you take a look at that specific thing? Absolutely. Okay. If that once we do that, 
it's not a massive increase in what we need from a funding perspective. We just make the update and we move forward if it's within our existing contracts, authority, you know, what we've got it from spending authority and everything, we can just make that happen. If it does trigger something significant, then just know that our funding process then becomes important. So our budget change proposal has already started for July of 2025. In other words, it's almost too late for a good idea for 2025. Um, because the way that works is we internally develop a budget change proposal. We brief those through our executive um, through the end of say July, where, which we're already passed. Then it goes to Department of Finance in the fall to be included in the governor's budget in January to then be discussed and voted on through the budget process that happens from January through May. There is a May revised process that exists for emergency type things that are absolutely critical. So if it was something like that, we, we have one more opportunity in May, but just know that that's the process. So if let's say we needed 50 million more dollars to do something that you all recommended, we would want to know that before say March of that year so then we can start our internal process to get all this moving so that's like big picture but yes you can make any recommendation you want and really that's what you're required to do by statute i mean that's why this board exists right. to see things that that we might be overlooking and and that's why we brief out like we do so that you can give us that feedback so we absolutely want want you and need you to do that so one thing i would ask is when this comes back for the overall presentation i think it's great to have studies but i think actions most important is um maybe when that comes back there might be some ideas that you could toss around to us to start discussing to say like maybe if you're interested it might be too late for them but maybe we might request a pilot project of a pool of money kind of like when gis first came out right there was a one-time pool that agencies could access to start acting on this study i realize you can't help with salaries and those sorts of things but maybe there are some one-time things that we could recommend and start building that confidence. Because I know one of the other issues is not a, a lot of places responded. And I think that's driven by, we all get constant stream of studies, but actions don't follow a lot of the time. And maybe there's an opportunity that we could act in a limited basis. Um, and I would lean more on the members that are actually doing the dispatching of stuff to help kind of guide that conversation. But um, I want to support some sort of action based upon it to the extent that's with, within our authority. Yeah, absolutely. When we get that updated draft in our our team will take a look at that and we'll work with the LRPC. So from a timing perspective, is it reasonable to request that this updated draft be made available and published beginning of October? So everybody has time to review. Is that sort of the timeline you're on? And and I, I don't know the answer to this, which is why I'm asking in a public meeting. So I'm putting you on the spot kind yeah, of, but um, I, can they have that done by October? So that way everybody has time to review it. So November meeting is meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we'll do then. We'll update that on our website by October. You all will have it. And then I think from there, um, it would be interesting to hear the LRPC's perspective on recommended actions that support that report. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously our team can do the same. You know, we, we can put together some of the things that we're thinking. Um, and then you as board members, when you read that in October, same thing. So then we come in November with some definitive actions that we can potentially take. Some might be longer lead time items, some might be near term, but at least we'll be able to have a really robust conversation in November around this. Does that sound yep. good? Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah, and that sounds, we've been thinking this way all along, but now we've got it definitively in place with clear timelines, so I'm excited about that. All right, any other conversation from the board on this agenda item? All right. Any comments from the public, either in the room or online, on agenda item number eight? All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right. Agenda item number nine. Uh, we'll entertain uh, any agenda items for future meetings. Um, we'll retain this staffing study, obviously, because that's in today's. And then we did uh, have a request to have Mark come and talk about what virtual consolidation looks like and, and how you sort of accomplish that. So, um, you know, we'll have a, a section for you to so let us know how much time you need to, to do that. And we'll, we'll definitely put that on the agenda. I would say like five to 10 minutes. Okay. So we'll definitely carve that out. Just, 
get us the slides and coordinate with, with Samantha on that so we have them. Um, we'll definitely have that on the agenda for the next time. Any other agenda items? I had a question and that'll drive whether it needs to be an item. When we go to the uh, cloud CPEs, will the text to 91 be integrated or will it stay as over the top? It is integrated in the new contract. Okay, then I don't need it. Thank okay. You. <laughs> All right. Any other agenda items for future meetings from the board? Okay, our next board meeting is November 20th. We believe it will be back in rooms 115 A and B. However, we're in the process of potentially doing a technology upgrade in that room to integrate the communication system better into the room. And we might not be done then, or we might have just started, so we may be back here. But the, the public meeting notice will tell us where it is. It will be at, the, at this facility, either in this room or over in 115 A and B if they finish the work over there. All right, um, any other comments on agenda item number nine? All right, agenda item number 10 is public comment. So we'll start with the board members. Any comments or items for discussion for anything that was not on the agenda that you all wanna talk about? All right, any public comment in the room? We'll start there. Any public comment online, you seeing anything? All right, hearing none. Move to agenda item number 11, adjournment. Anybody have going to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion for Mark. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All right, second from Kurt. And we are adjourned. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's uh, participation today, and we look forward to talking with you at the next board meeting. Meetings adjourned.